Hey, I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. For the past week and a half, every time people in the UK got behind the wheel of a car, they had to think about something that we often take for granted, whether or not they had enough gas to get to their destination. Here's our Europe correspondent, Paul Waldy, who's based out of London. You're seeing far fewer cars on the road. It's picked up a little bit around here, but there were some days last week when it was like back to the lockdown days when there was no traffic. People are just afraid to drive anywhere for fear of not being able to get gas. The shortage of fuel at gas stations has created a ton of confusion. There have been long lineups at stations that do have fuel, and in some places, reports of fights breaking out. This is happening at the same time as a couple of other major energy crises severe power shortages in China that are impacting people and industry, and surging energy prices across the European Union that have experts worried about how people are going to stay warm this coming winter. I think in Canada, one thing we can probably expect is that this winter is going to be more expensive than we have experienced in a while when it comes to heating our homes, especially if it's a cold winter. Jeffrey Jones is a reporter and columnist for The Globe's Report on Business. He's been following the story, and he's on the show to explain the reasons behind each of these crises, what ties them all together, and what it says about the challenges ahead, including here in Canada, as we transition to clean energy. You're listening to The Decibel. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So there are a few different energy crises happening around the world simultaneously. And and first of all, there has been chaos at gas stations in the UK because of a shortage of fuel. What's behind uh, what's happening at the gas stations in the UK? Well, interestingly, in the UK, it is less a problem of gasoline supply than it is a problem of people to drive the tanker trucks to fill up the, the stations. There's been this huge shortage of, uh, of labor, mm-hmm. more so than gasoline. And uh, one of the problems that has been cited, and I think the conservative government in, in Britain uh, tries to play this down, is that since Brexit, uh, there has been an exodus of truck drivers back to the EU. It's going to take some time uh, for the UK to develop a whole new army of of truck drivers. And it's not just gasoline, by the way. It is uh, truck drivers writ large. But uh, this is where the problems have really uh, coalesced. Right. Okay. so that's the situation in the UK. And let's talk about China for a second. So in China, we're seeing rolling blackouts in some areas and factories have been forced to shut down or suspend operations to conserve power. And I've seen economic analysts are very worried about the potential ripple effects of this. So why are we seeing these blackouts in China? Well, China still runs very much on coal, despite some ambitious plans to replace its electrical system with renewables coal is still king. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things have happened. First of all, uh, China stopped purchasing coal from a major supplier that it had, and that was Australia. Um, At the same time, coal prices have been surging while electricity prices have been kept by the government artificially low. Mm -hmm. So it just isn't economically feasible to uh, run a lot of these power plants. So rather than operating at a loss, Some of them have had to shut down or they've had to go through a rolling blackout situation. And uh, it's had a big effect on on the manufacturing capacity in that country. We've also been hearing about how people's power bills and the European Union have been going up like crazy. So what kind of increases are we talking about and what's behind that crisis? Well, we have seen some massive increases, as a matter of fact, both in Europe and in Asia. So uh, prices uh, that have been recorded have been well over the price of oil going into the the triple digits. And uh, Mm -hmm. the reason for that is just a competition around the world for supplies after they had been contracting during the months following the pandemic. 
Is there a common thread between all of these different crises that we've been talking about? I would say the common thread is that the energy transition as we envision it, that is a slow changeover to more renewable sources, is going to be bumpy. It's going to be messy. There are going to be times when there are disruptions in energy supply. There are going to be times when prices surge just because there isn't a reliable wind slash solar solution to step in yet. Why can't renewables fill the gap if the problem is a shortage in coal and energy? Is it just that the technology isn't there yet? There's a question of technology, and, and I should say, by the way, the technology is improving every day. It's, there's billions of dollars being put into improving the reliability of renewables. Everything from different types of storage solutions to account for the variability of wind blowing and sun shining, as well as batteries, all of these types of things are being developed quite quickly. So I don't think there's any reason to be pessimistic about that. But I do think Mm -hmm. that um, there had been an expectation that, among some people anyway, that you would just be able to turn a switch on at some point and the world's energy systems would change. Now we're seeing that it's going to be a much more difficult road to that and it's going to take a lot longer than some people would like. And how did the pandemic affect energy demand and supply exactly? Well, I mean, this is kind of a problem around the world. Let's cast our minds back, shall we, to some very dark days. That of April and May 2020, when a lot of us were locked down. And so while we were trying to bake sourdough bread and watching Netflix, the energy Mm -hmm. industry was having a crisis that was kind of going on behind the scenes. And that was that while we were locked down, we weren't in our cars driving and we weren't in our planes flying. So supplies were backing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll recall that it's it became almost a uh, an existential crisis for the global energy industry, which was running out of places to put its oil and gas production. So it had to slam its spending shut for a period of time to deal with this massive drop in demand. So now, as demand increases with the recovery from the pandemic, uh, the oil industry is on its back feet, trying to replenish supplies while global demand uh, goes up quickly. Now, the problem, of course, is that we're heading into winter, and Mm -hmm. uh, that's when the Northern Hemisphere Uh, requires fuel, both oil, gas, coal, or heating. Um, And so that is where this uh, price and and supply crunch is really, really taking place. Why is it so challenging to replenish that supply quickly and ramp up production quickly to meet this rise in demand that we're seeing? Well, first of all, we're seeing two things. Uh, One of them is that uh, when the global oil industry stopped spending, Production was not only not rising anymore, it was they were having a difficult time maintaining output because that's what happens. I mean, if you're not drilling wells, the production actually declines. So you have to actually keep drilling in order to keep production at even a, uh, a steady rate. So that's one thing. And another thing is taking place kind of in the financial markets where the investors in oil and gas companies are saying, look, we have had years of declining returns from you guys. And what we'd like to see, rather than you spending money increasing production, we would like to see some money back in the form of dividends as well as share buybacks. So uh, if any company, and this is this is not just a North American problem, but, it's, but it is acute here. If any company says, well, we're going to suddenly go ahead and start spending our money on increasing production, they're going to get punished in the stock market for that. And what do experts say about what a smart energy transition looks like so we can avoid seeing more of these kinds of disruptions? I think that there are a bunch of solutions that are being talked about. One is, for instance, carbon capture and storage. So 
kind of a, uh, a transition technology to say that, look, we've already got all of the infrastructure in place in our economies for fossil fuels. I mean, take a look down your street, you're going to see nothing but vast majority of, of cars and SUVs and trucks that still run on gasoline. So what do we do to minimize carbon emissions from all those sources and carbon capture and storage from the source is one technology that is being talked about as something to help along with the transition. Mm -hmm. I should also say that there has already been a lot of transition done. It was really interesting last year, I thought, when Alberta of all places said that uh, its transition from coal-fired power would be complete in 2023. So mm -hmm. that is seven years ahead of what the province had originally thought it was going to do. So the technology is there. I mean, recall that in 2014, just before that policy to move out of coal was introduced, in 2014, Alberta had 55% coal-fired power, and that's going to be completely gone in two years. So the technology is moving quite quickly. So you mentioned winter is coming, and I know the Chinese government's worried about this. They've directed all of their state-owned companies to secure supply and do everything they can to shield the Chinese public from a potential power shortage in the winter. Is that something that we should be worried about in Canada as winter is approaching? I think in Canada, one thing we can probably expect is that this winter is going to be more expensive than we have experienced in a while when it comes to heating our homes, especially if it's a cold winter, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, natural gas prices have been surging uh, across North America. Now, I don't think you should worry about shortages, mm -hmm. but when it comes to prices for gas and electricity, most analysts see because of, of a shortage of stored supplies um, that prices will be much higher this winter. So why do you think we should be paying attention to energy crises in other parts of the world, like China, for example? What kind of impact could it have here? Well, we live in a globalized economy. And when it comes to energy, it's becoming much more of a global issue than it has been in the past. I mean, obviously, in North America, we've had a very integrated energy system for many, many years. And uh, that has served both Canada and the United States very well. But when it comes to the idea of shifting to more renewable sources, this is going to mean that a lot of the energy systems that we've relied upon have to be changed to account for more integrated and, and smart grids, for instance. Um, when it comes to natural gas, it's becoming a much more of, a, of, a, of an export commodity where mm -hmm. we've got liquefied natural gas plants located on the U.S. Gulf Coast, and we've got them being built here in Canada as well. So the more export, the more trade we see in natural gas, the more we will be subject to the swings of uh, global natural gas and energy prices. Energy is the foundation of everything that we buy and uh, our ability to move around. Uh, so when it comes to the import of goods from China, let's say, if they are producing less uh, because of their own energy crunches, this is going to mean that there will be more competition for uh, it's, it's manufactured goods around the world. And mm -hmm. when uh, they become more scarce than they have been in the past because of higher energy prices or because of factory slowdowns, obviously we're going to see some inflation in, um, in our imports of those goods as well. So what does all of this tell us about where we're at in our transition to green energy? What kind of lessons can we take from what's been happening? I think we should be careful not to say that all of these uh, separate problems with price jumps and with disruptions in supply are because of the shift to renewable energy. I think that would be wrong. But I do think that when it comes to the energy transition itself, I see it as kind of an amorphous blob of time 
that started a few years ago and ends sometime between now and 2050. And if you're talking to somebody in the fossil fuel industry, there's a good chance they'd like to see that transition end closer to that target time, 2050. If you're talking to a climate activist, uh, they'd like to see more action done now. Um, but the truth is you can't flick a switch and suddenly switch over right now. The, we do not have the, the technology to bring all of that in, a, in an affordable way to all parts of the world. And we're still living with all kinds of networks that support the old way of powering ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So it's gonna take some time. So we're moving close to COP26, the UN climate talks that take place in Glasgow in just a few weeks time. And I think one of the things that a lot of experts are waiting for are clear timelines as to how this energy transition is going to play out. So interim targets that are ruled by uh, technology's ability to replace fossil fuels in a gradual way. It's mm -hmm. not going to be a switchover uh, that is going to be quick, but it's going to take some ambition to actually get there, to get to net zero within a time frame that allows us to prevent some of the worst effects of climate change. Okay, Jeff, thank you so much. Thanks, it was fun. All right, that's it for today. I'm Tamara Pendacker. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Kasia Mihailovich. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thank you so much to Jeffrey Jones. You can find him on Twitter at the underscore Jeff underscore Jones. If you want to reach us, you can email us at thedecibel at globeandmail.com. If you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter at anima underscore TK. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>